Thank you very much for coming uh, this evening to our third uh, annual uh, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Health Equity Lecture. My name is Margaret Tando, and I'm the Associate Dean for uh, Diversity and Inclusion here at the um, College of Medicine. Um, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Kamara Jones, uh, who's uh, our uh, speaker this evening. Our program, though, is made possible today uh, through the hard work of, in uh, collaboration of many of our campus uh, and uh, community colleagues. We are especially grateful to the Dean for his dedication and his uh, support and, who, and uh, the opportunity that he has afforded us to uh, connect with the King's ideals. Uh, the university as a whole has a celebration the um, whole week and even in, into next week, so I hope you will um, participate in, in some of those activities. Um, now it's my honor to uh, introduce uh, our speaker tonight, Dr. Kamara Jones. Uh, let me just say she had a rough time getting here, um, <laughs> which is a little understatement. I was in the uh, operating room about 12.30, finishing up a case and texting Tiffany, is she here yet, Tiffany? And then I, at one point I sent her, I said, I bet you she doesn't even come in tonight. But uh, she made it almost at, um, around one. She was able to get in from Atlanta. Um, and uh, she's been a joy, and uh, it's really my uh, honor to um, have her here today. Uh, she is uh, the current president of the American Public Health Association and also the senior fellow at the Satcher Health Leadership Institute and Cardiovascular Research Institute at the uh, Morehouse School of Medicine. Dr. Jones is an epidemiologist uh, whose work focuses on the impact of uh, racism on the health and well-being of the uh, nation. She seeks to uh, broaden the, the uh, national health debate uh, to include not only universal access to quality uh, health care, but, but also attention to the social determinants of health and uh, equity. Uh, she received her BA in uh, molecular biology from, from uh, Wellesley College and then her uh, MD from Stanford University. She also received her, her MPH and uh, PhD from, um, from John, Johns Hopkins um, School of uh, <coughs> Public Health. She is a member of the WHO's uh, scientific research, research group on uh, equity and health and also the uh, National Board of Pu Public Health um, Examiners. Please welcome uh, me in um, um, introducing and welcoming Dr. Jones. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Tondo. Thank you for everybody for being here. Um, it's my pleasure, first of all, to bring greetings from the American Public Health Association, um, but where my presidential initiative is to launch a national campaign against racism. So I am going to share with you some thoughts. First of all, why I, as a physician and epidemiologist, will be talking about racism. So I'm going to start with like a cartoon animation to help explain that. And then I'll turn into what is racism and basically say why I would come to Vermont to talk about racism. After all, in the airport, so I was in the airport for 18 hours. Uh, and so, you know, people, you know, we're all sitting around muttering, what are, you know, what are we going to do? You know, and so somebody says, well, why are you going to Burlington? And I said, well, I'm coming to do this talk at the College of Medicine on racism and health. And somebody said, well, Vermont is the whitest state in the nation. The second now, but they said the whitest. And then, and then I was like, oh, really? So then everybody's on their phone, right? And they said, oh, oh, oh Maine is the, is the first. Vermont is the second, and New Hampshire is the close third. OK, so we're all up here in the, in the Northeast. So I'll share with you some insights about why I think all of us to have, need to have a national campaign against racism. I'll share with you some data on racism and health, and then I'll close out with some more of my allegories, my teaching stories, which make it much easier for us to have conversations about this topic, which sometimes makes people feel afraid, guilty, angry, sad. There are lots of reactions. But I think that we can have a very productive conversation about the impacts of racism on the health and well-being of the nation. So let me get started. So I'm going to start first with a cartoon animation which is all about levels of health intervention. Here we go. Doot, 
do, 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 whoops, boom. Somebody just fell off of the cliff of good health. And if that were you or somebody in your family, you would be delighted to find an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff to speed you on to care. But if we were concerned about others who might come along that cliff face, if we were concerned about population health or community health or public health, we might well ask ourselves, what can we put in place as a health intervention besides just stationing lots of ambulances at the bottom? So somebody's going to say, I know, I know, no. Let's, let's put a net halfway down, right? Because at least if people fall, we can catch them before they get crunched up at the bottom. And that's an excellent idea. Although, you know, nets do have holes in them. So some people might fall through the cracks. <laughs> but we could even make that a trampoline halfway down. No holes in a trampoline, right? <laughs> But even if we have a trampoline halfway down that cliff, we might find ourselves with lots of people just bouncing up and down at half functionality, not able to get back to the top of the cliff. So what else could we put in place as a health intervention? Well, we could put a fence at the edge of the cliff to keep people from falling in the first place. Great idea. But that's going to have to be a very, very strong fence if there's a lot of population pressure against it. So what else can we do as a health intervention? Well, we can move the population away from the edge of the cliff. So I'm going to label the interventions that I've described so far, where the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff clearly represents medical care and what we in public health describe as tertiary prevention. So in public health, we talk about three levels of prevention, primary, secondary, and tertiary, where tertiary prevention is preventing the complications from illness that's already manifest. For example, preventing amputations from diabetes and the like. The net or trampoline halfway down, these are our safety net programs and secondary prevention, where secondary prevention is about early detection, screening programs, so um, you know, maybe prenatal care type of thing. The fence represents primary prevention, keeping things from happening in the first place, perhaps immunizations and the like. And moving the population away from the edge of the cliff is the whole discussion we're having in the public health side of things now about addressing the social determinants of health, the determinants of health and illness that are outside of the individual, beyond our genes, beyond our individual behaviors, and in fact, the context of our lives, the context that even makes people have certain behaviors or make the behaviors that all of us might share dangerous in one circumstance and not in, in the other. So these social determinants of health include Things like poverty or wealth. They include neighborhood conditions, like do you live where there's a, a sidewalk or not? Is it, do you have street lights in a city context? You know, is it safe for you to, even to walk in your neighborhood? Are the playgrounds where the children can you know, frolic and commune with nature, is that where drugs are being sold? Do you live in a so-called food desert? All of these kinds of neighborhood contextual factors. So, you know, we could have a conversation about infant mortality where the ambulance might be our neonatal intensive care units and the net could be prenatal care. The fence might be our women, infants, and children, maternal nutrition programs. Moving the population might be having excellent educational opportunities so that young girls didn't have babies as early. You know, we could use this cliff to go and march up to the state house and talk about how we need to be spending, you know, how should we spend our resources? How much should be in ambulances versus all of these other things. We could talk to a community about this. As useful as the diagram so far could be, however, there's a huge fatal flaw. And the flaw so far is that it does not address how health disparities arise. So I want you to keep this cliff in the back of your mind. We're going to shift gears for just a moment to talk about how health disparities arise on three levels. And then we'll come back to the cliff. So, how do health disparities arise? Well, especially when you're considering racial ethnic health disparities, we unfortunately have lots of evidence about differences in the quality of care received even within the same healthcare system. So even within the VA system or even for everybody covered by Medicaid or Medicare, the Institute of Medicine in 2002 reviewed what were then hundreds of studies. If we were to do the same thing today, it would be thousands of studies documenting differences in for example, how vigorously your chest pain might be investigated, depending on your race or your ethnicity, or differences in how much pain medication you might get if you walked into an emergency department with a long bone fracture, depending on your ethnicity or your race. But even that Institute of Medicine panel in their unequal treatment report, they recognized that it wasn't all what was happening within the healthcare system because there's a second level at which health disparities arise, which is access to the healthcare system in the first place. 
But then all of us in this room need to recognize that there's a third level at which health disparities arise because health is not created within the health sector. And so that third level are differences in the conditions of our lives, differences in our underlying you know, life opportunities or exposures or stresses that are making some individuals and communities sicker than others in the first place. And when you think about these three levels at which health disparities arise, differences in quality of care, differences in access to care, and differences in underlying exposures and opportunities, really it's like a pyramid. Or better yet, it's like a huge iceberg where the huge hidden base of it are the differences in the quality of our lives. And then those people who often are the ones who've been made sicker are usually the same ones who are frustrated because of limited access to the healthcare system. And then even the lucky ones who get into the healthcare system are sometimes further injured because of differences in quality of care. So now I want to go back to the cliff thinking about these three levels at which health disparities arise. But now we're going to recognize that we're not dealing with a flat two-dimensional cliff, but actually, ba -ba, we're dealing with a three-dimensional cliff. And at some parts of the cliff, there might be an ambulance there, but maybe that ambulance has a flat tire. So it's slower, goes off in the wrong direction. Or maybe there's no ambulance there at all, and maybe there's no net, nor fence, and usually at those parts of the cliff, the population is being pushed closer to the edge. So now I'm going to describe how health disparities arise looking at this three-dimensional cliff, where the differences in quality of care that's represented when the ambulance is there, but it's slower, goes off in the wrong direction. Differences in access to care, no ambulance, no net, no fence, and differences in underlying exposures and opportunities represented by the closer proximity of that greeny population to the edge. So now that we recognize that we're really dealing with a three-dimensional cliff, there's a whole new set of questions that arise. The first of all being, of course, how did the cliff become three-dimensional in the first place? And that's usually because of historical injustices that are perpetuated through present-day contemporary structural factors. But given that the cliff is three-dimensional, we need to also ask, why are there differences in how the resources are distributed along the cliff face? And why are there differences? And who's found at different parts of the cliff? Why are the oranges back here in a way, and the greenies being pushed closer to the edge? And when you start asking and addressing these kinds of questions, you're actually doing something that differs from addressing the social determinants of health, like poverty and adverse neighborhood conditions. And like it's something different from moving the population away from the edge of the cliff you're now addressing what I describe as the social determinants of equity, which are systems of power that can distribute resources and populations. And they include racism, sexism, heterosexism, geographicism, all of these systems of power, even economic systems like capitalism and the like. And actually, on this three-dimensional cliff, I've distilled three different dimensions of health intervention where if you go back to your junior high or high school geometry, you know, one dimension is a line, two dimensions is a flat plane, three dimensions is space. In that line along the edge of the cliff is where we could display all of our curative and preventive health services. You know, when we talk about the Affordable Care Act or we talk even about universal access to high quality health care, this is what we're talking about, right? And that's a very important conversation that we need to know. Have. We need, I would hope that everybody in this room would endorse universal access to high quality health care. But we have to recognize that that in and of itself is not going to result in large and sustained improvements in health outcomes or the elimination of health disparities. The reason we want that is because that's how a civilized society values all of its people equally. But as stellar as the health care system is and as universal as the access is, if everybody's crowded up against that fence, we can overwhelm any system. So in, we must also address the social determinants of health. We have to go into that second dimension and move the population away from the edge of the cliff, addressing poverty and adverse housing conditions and educational opportunities and criminal justice system. Like We need to move the population away from the edge of the cliff if we're going to have large and sustained improvements in health outcomes. But if we do that without recognizing that we're really dealing with a three-dimensional cliff, we're at risk of moving some of the population away from the cliff, but not all of the population, and we're actually at risk of making health disparities worse. So we must acknowledge and address the three-dimensionality of the cliff and be all about 
having equity in terms of distribution of resources and you know, moving everybody away from the edge of the cliff if we're going to achieve social justice and eliminate health disparities. So we have to name and address racism, sexism, heterosexism, capitalism, and the like if we're going to achieve social justice. Now, I didn't say at the very beginning, but I do not want this to be me lecturing at you. We are a small and intimate enough group that at any point, if you have a question you want to ask, a challenge, and amen anything, I take it all. So I actually am about to shift gears, so I would like to invite at least one person to ask me a question about this cliff before I... Now, the reason I start with a general audience about using this cliff analogy, and the reason that I start with a health audience using this cliff analogy is like, why am I as a family physician epidemiologist coming and talking about racism at all? And it's because racism is one of those social determinants of equity. We, if we're going to do anything, we can do, have all of our little ambulances set up there. I know I'm speaking to many people who are trying to become the best ambulance driver they can be. I understand where I am. I'm at a medical school with medical students and medical faculty, right? And we're all about being the best ambulance driver we can be. And we need that ambulance, and we need it fast, and we need it on, you know, to be on. But we also need to recognize that there's all this other stuff that, first of all, can keep our patient prop, you know, population at the bottom of the cliff down, that all of this is part of the health enterprise. And even if we, as individuals, are trying to be the best ambulance driver we can be, as a citizen, we can be all about moving the population away from the edge of the cliff and addressing the social determinants of equity. So I just wanted to say that. And now I'd like to take at least one question. I see one back here. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, my, my question is basically, in, in trying to understand, in trying to affect systems of power that relate to all the different systems that we talked about, is it possible for individual professionals or even special organizations to change things that have such huge vested interests behind them, such huge infrastructure that supports them, or does it take the sort of large grassroots movement that the civil rights era had or that other social justice efforts had? Like, can, can we do it by just publishing research in journals for scholars? Can we do it as professionals, or does it take the masses, does it take large groups of people? So I will say, answer it in two ways. First of all, we need collective action always to, to get things. And sometimes we are raised to think of ourselves as individuals and, and to think about our individual efficacy as opposed to collective efficacy. So we definitely need collective action in all of this. But I'm not afraid of big systems because these things are, in fact, systems with identifiable and addressable mechanisms. And the mechanisms, I'll talk about that in a little bit more, but the mechanisms are in our decision-making processes. So, you know, who's at the table? What's on the agenda? So structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision-making. Policies are the written how of decision-making. Practices and norms are the unwritten how of decision-making, and values are the why. And we can interrogate, you know, racism, sexism, heterosexism, all of these things, capitalism, by looking at these mechanisms of decision-making. You know, and, 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 it, and ask the question, how is racism operating here, for example, and attack that. But I do agree that we need to have, each of us can be agenda setters in our own little setting, so we can name racism. We can ask, how is racism operating here? But then we have to organize and strategize to act with others. We can start in our little groups. It's, if you are the only one in your setting saying racism, then people are going to marginalize you in a minute. Okay, and there, there she goes again. Right? Chip on her shoulder. Right? So I do recommend that if you're going to start in your department or in your class or your little study group or whatever, that uh, I'm going to share with you some, some allegories that can help get the conversation started. And you use one of these allegories. You say, oh, I just went to a talk, and I heard this thing. Here's a four-page paper. Let's discuss this next week. And then out of the conversation around that, then you will identify your allies. Then you get off with your allies and say, okay, so what are we going to do now? Right? So it's sort of a stealth way of identifying allies. But yes, collective action is necessary, but each of us, we can't wait. We have to start that, and it's going to be like little, little nidises, you know, starting, and then we coalesce. But the agenda setting, I actually think that, um, especially with regard to racism, we have to say the whole word racism. We can't stop with race or, you know, there are a lot of things, you know, diversity is important, inclusion is important, discrimination, 
implicit bias, all, all of these things, you know, cultural competence, very important things for us to be talking about race. But we have to say the whole word racism, and I haven't even defined it for you yet, I will in a sec. But we have to say that if we're going to really, otherwise we're complicit with the denial. Okay. Is there any other quick questions? So I am really at risk of talking and talking and talking and answering questions, but I, I do want to answer them. But then somebody's going to have to say, oh, please get back to the presentation. Okay. It's less of a question, maybe something you're going to address, but I think um, based on what you were just saying, um, for the previous question, I think the challenge that I've always faced is how to move it from discussion around racism when you identify who your allies are in the sense of other people who kind of see eye to eye um, and agree that this is a core issue and a core determining health to actual action. Like what are the specific, and this might be something you're, you're going to talk about, but I just wanted to throw it out there. Like what are a few key practical steps that different types of organizations or individuals can take? So, you know, for example, in a primary care setting or um, you know, I work for state government, so what are, what are different action steps that a group of allies that recognizes this can actually take to make practical steps towards progress? So I'm going to start answering that, and then I'll, I'll keep highlighting as I go through. But one of the most important things right now is to shine the bright light of inquiry everywhere to say, is there something differential going on by race here? Now, at first, you know, 30 years ago, if you were to ask a group of physicians, do you think that, that the vigorousness of, in, of you know, treating a heart attack differs by race? Oh, no, no, because we're all good-hearted people, we're all physicians. People would be in denial. Now we know it's very well documented. That's because people shown the bright light of inquiry in the VA system, first of all, and then at other systems to say, is there something happening differentially in terms of outcomes? So shining the bright light of inquiry. But then we don't need to just stop there. We need to shift not just from outcomes to opportunities. So we need to say, well, what's happening here in terms of uh, opportunity structures, you know, neighborhoods, job opportunities, schooling opportunities. Is there something differential going on here? Is there something, people are talking a lot now about health impact assessment, you know, so if somebody proposes to build a highway, what is the health impact assessment? We need to extend that to equity impact assessment. Are there predictable differential impacts on different populations if we take this policy or if we do nothing? And one of the hardest things, when it, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but um, often institutionalized racism shows up as inaction in the face of need. So are we not acting when action is called for? Is there neglect or inattention? Uh, Flint, Michigan, oh my god, okay. Why is there no response if it were a different population, you know, so that kind of thing. So, so to, to pay attention to the absence of, when you find yourself at a decision-making table, look around and say, well, who is not here at this table who has an interest in this proceeding? And then you don't just try to represent them, you try to find them, over time, a way to the table. Agenda setting, things that, if we're parts of organizations, don't just do like, you know, the party every year. I mean, like, try to work on some real work. Ask the question, how is racism operating here? Looking at structures, policies, practices, norms and values. So, so I'm gonna, do a tinker with that and then ask it again and see if there, at the end, I might even think of other things. But it, does that get you started? Yes. It's part of it is just really believing that this is not a big cloud or a miasma that we can't get a handle on. This is a real system with identifiable and addressable mechanisms. Yes. Contrast is often called out between Scandinavian countries and the U.S. and cause of health care and the outcome of health care. They mm. much less, they get much better outcome than the least we in the world. Right. But if you look at the Scandinavian countries and you look at, at the, the income redistribution and the educational opportunities uh, and the quality of education, they, they spend a great deal on addressing the social determinants of equity in mm -hmm. the first place. To put those together, it doesn't look as different. Uh, right. They get a lot of their effect uh, because of the, of the, the social terms of equity investments that they make in the first place. Right. I would say, so I would say that the investments that I'm looking, I would even call them the social determinants of health investments, so that they're doing a lot of the contextual things. I actually haven't looked at some of the Scandinavian countries in terms of their equity pieces. Are, are, they, are they carefully looking at 
for example, Im so-called immigrants or, you know, gypsies or migrant workers or, who, you know, who might be coming there. So I don't know, but I agree with you. I saw a, a, a graph last week that was looking at the OECD, whatever it is, well, you know, oh, the advanced, I, I forget what it stands for, nations, the proportion, so their total expenditures on health plus social things, and then the ranking in terms of their health outcomes. So we, of course, in all of these countries, we rank in this like 16 countries, we were the lowest with the highest expenditure on health and the lowest for social services. So it's, it's not that people aren't spending the money, they're spending it, as you say, on different things, which are having better outcomes for the nation and for the people. You have better productivity and, and all of that, happiness, joy, longer life, all of that. So I agree with you. What we're doing is we're trying to make the fanciest, fastest ambulance, but we don't have it everywhere. We can only afford to have one over there. And the others are, maybe their ambulances aren't as fast or shiny, but they're doing a whole lot of moving the population away from the edge of the cliff so they don't even have to use the ambulances as much. Okay, so I am going to uh, speed into now a conversation specifically on racism. Sometimes in a very general audience, I say, well, I've said the word racism about three or four times now. Nobody fell out of their chair, so let's go. So now, so let's go, okay. So when I say that word racism, what do I mean? I am clear that I'm talking about a system. I am not talking about an individual character flaw or a personal moral failing or even a psychiatric illness as some people have suggested. I am talking about a system of power. And it's a system of doing what? It's a system of structuring opportunity and of assigning value. And on what basis is the opportunity structured and on what basis is the value assigned? It's based on the social interpretation of how we look, which is what we call race in this country. Now, you know, here in Vermont, in Burlington, you look at me and I'm clearly black. That's true in Atlanta, too. But if you were to look at me in some parts of Brazil, I would be just as clearly white as I would in Congo. If you were to look at me in South Africa, I'd be clearly colored. So here I am, five places I've mentioned right now, same physical appearance, but the social interpretation of my appearance in those five places would assign me to different racial groups. And furthermore, if I were to stay in any of those places long enough, my health outcome would probably take on that of the group to which I've been assigned, even though I have the same genes in all three places. In fact, we think that our racial cl classification is so clear, but people come from outside of the country and they don't have, they have to learn how we are classifying different people. And people come from outside the country, maybe they're Maori in New Zealand and they come here and they're white. Oh, big surprise, right? So, so this is race as a social construct, as the social interpretation, how we look, and racism as a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on so-called race. What are the impacts of this system? Well, number one, it unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities. And when we think or talk about racism at all in this country, this is immediately where we go. But I have to tell you, it doesn't take very long to recognize that every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage, so that racism is also unfairly advantaging other individuals and communities. And that's the whole issue of unearned white privilege, which is quite difficult for many people to talk about in this country. But I'm gonna give you a, a little story at the end that will make even that a topic that we can discuss. But even as we recognize, okay, we have a system that's either unfairly disadvantaging or unfairly advantaging individuals and communities, racism is sapping the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. Many examples of that, but I'm just going to give you two. The first of all being how we as a nation are not vigorously investing in the full, excellent public education of all of our children. Because the blinders of racism that don't value all of us equally are making us believe that there is no genius in the barrios or in the ghettos or on the reservations or in the refugee resettlement areas, right? We can get along very well, thank you, without those kids. But of course, there is genius in all of our communities. And if we were to vigorously invest in that genius, we could be doing so much better as a nation or even as a world. I have, I have often said that we would already be up on Mars farming if that were a good thing to do, if we were to invest in all of that genius, right? Another example of how racism and these blinders that don't value all of us equally impact, you know, sap the strength of the whole society is how it has made us as a nation complacent. 
with what I describe as the wholesale warehousing disproportionately of so many of our black and brown men in the prison system. As if that did not separate us from human potential, right? So if you know any folks who have been in the prison, maybe they're still there, maybe they're cycling in and out, come out, can't vote in many states, can't get public housing, can't get a job, right? You know that there are many geniuses that if there had only been some other way would be contributing very productively and positively to our society. In fact, we could go on and on. I think that that bullet about how racism saps the strength of the whole society is actually perhaps the most important manifestation of racism. It's important to talk about the unfair disadvantage and the reciprocal advantage, but if we did media stories or data collection, or if we did conversations around our dinner tables about how racism saps the strength of all of us, we might get more people on board to help dismantle this system and put in place a system in which all people can know and develop to their full potentials. Now, in order to understand how racism impacts health, I find it useful to think about three levels of racism, institutionalized, personally mediated, and internalized. So I'm going to very briefly define these, give you some quick examples of how they can impact health, and then I'm going to illustrate these three levels of racism with my Gardner's Tale allegory. So institutionalized racism, that is the system, right? You know, the structures, policies, practices, norms, and values that result in differential access to the good services and opportunities of society by race. This is the kind of racism that does not require an identifiable perpetrator. This is the kind of racism that shows up as inherited disadvantage or its reciprocal inherited advantage. You know, it's the kind of racism that shows up in terms of material conditions as well as in terms of access to power. So examples include differential access to housing by race or differential access to excellent educational opportunities or equal employment opportunities or even the same level of income at the same level of employment and these things clearly impact health. Differential access to medical facilities, including linguistic access to medical facilities. Differential access to a clean environment, including the very well-documented disproportionate placement of toxic dump sites in communities of color, or bus transfer stations in communities of color. And differential access to power is information, could be information, you know, health information, but it also could be information about our own histories. Differential access to power as resources, not just material capital resources, but social networking resources, knowing somebody on the board. Differential access to power as voice in government and media and the like. And I'm gonna interrupt myself here because sometimes just about now somebody raises their hand and says, Dr. Jones, excuse me, would you please look at that top bullet of examples, housing, education, employment, and income. Why do you have that on your slide about racism? Isn't that what we call social class? So Dr. Jones, are you really talking about racism or are you really, really talking about social class? And that's a very important question. And I know there are many of you who are like, okay, so <laughs> what are you gonna say to that? So I'm going to answer that question, starting with the observation that it doesn't just so happen that people of color in this country are overrepresented in poverty while white people in this country are overrepresented in wealth. That is not just a happenstance. And for each marginalized, stigmatized, oppressed group of color, there's been some initial historical insult. So for American Indians, it was the taking of the land, and then the near genocide, and then for the survivors, the moving of the survivors to reserve lands, reservations, and then sometimes something good was found under one reservation, oops, gotta pick them up and move them somewhere else. You know, there, uh, you know, there were centuries of families that were living at what, what was once Mexico that now is New Mexico, and those families are being harassed today by the police, right? You have the history of Chinese laborers in this country. You have for Afri people of African descent in this country, the kidnapping of West African people and our importation across the Atlantic with tremendous loss of life in the Middle Passage. And then for the survivors, what I describe as the coerced usury of our unpaid labor for centuries to build this country, right? But then people stop me there, oh, Dr. Jones, there you go, right? <laughs> Talking about slavery. That was, an un that was an unfortunate chapter in our nation's history, they will say, right? But they say, Dr. Jones, the enslaved people were emancipated by 1865. 
We are in 2016. That was 151 years ago. So Dr. Jones, please, all else being equal, don't you think the impacts of slavery would have washed out by now? But the key phrase there is all else being equal. And all else has not been equal since 1865, and all else still is not equal today. And there are contemporary structural factors in our laws and customs and structures that are perpetuating each of those initial historical insults. So when people ask me, am I talking about social class or am I talking about racism, I explain that institutionalized racism, including those contemporary structural factors, explain why we even see an association between social class and race in this country. That's a very important insight. And I hope you all like, get that aha feeling. I'm going to take this question and then wind up. Yes? Or the poor turned against the poor. Race right. is used as a weapon to do so. The same way that there, there's obviously saying that people will benefit, there's a reason that those mechanisms are in place because people are using them to gain advantage, not that they might be bought off by the idea of saying, well, you're the superior race, but they're all, the real race is because someone else is benefiting from that conflict right. to maintain this. So I don't understand how you pull racism straight out and then are you saying that's the base? Or I guess like my concern would be that you're, you're tackling this one issue with all these issues, you're talking about sex, you're talking about heterosex, you're talking about problems of capitalism. You're not, you're having that one issue, and the problem is that would kind of be lost, and we'll be fighting that one cause, and all those other causes would be completely separate. That's what ends up being splintered rather than being an umbrella. Okay, so I don't think that I'm calling for that, but I am calling for us, right? Okay, so, but I am calling for us to name racism. And actually, in a few slides, I'm going to talk about all these other axes of inequity that are operating in our society today. But as I do that, my work is on race as the axis of inequity and racism as a system because it's foundational in our nation's history. So you might have a different argument about what's foundational in our nation's history. Maybe that's where we, where we might differ. But I, I agree with you that racism has created this. This fiction of race has been used to separate, you know, white sharecroppers from black sharecroppers, right? It's been used to separate white union members from blacks who would unionize, but are not allowed to. So there's a long history of race being used to separate people who would, on the face of it, have common collective interest because, because poor white folks want to feel like they're at least better than somebody. Right? And all of our imagery in this nation and all vilifies black people. People come from other countries. They come from Thailand, whatever. They don't want to be black. People come from, from the Caribbean. They don't want their kids to be associating with African American kids. People come from the African continent and they were like, well, what's wrong with these black people here until their children grow up and then have the same psychology because they're surrounded with images of you know, black folks being taken off in handcuffs. You know, I was, when I was in Baltimore, Maryland as a doctoral student, Two things. First, uh, one of my colleagues from Nigeria had a three-year-old son, and she said, Kamara, what should I do? My son just asked me, when I grow up, are they going to take me away in handcuffs? And I said, you need to finish your dissertation and get out of here, right? That's what she needed to do to save her son. But I don't have any place to save my son. So I just have to surround him with positive images and books and talks and, and, and prayers, you know, like that. But, that, but then at, around that same time, we, there was news that there was a middle school principal who was arrested for selling marijuana to her students. When we did not see her picture on the 6 o'clock news, what did we know? She was white. We couldn't even confirm that for two weeks. <laughs> we didn't see her picture for two weeks. Huh? She wasn't. If she was a black man, right, she'd be right up on, he'd be right up there. He would be right up there. If he were a black man, we would know immediately. Right. Yes. So can I ask you what, if, since you're talking about racism, on our main campus in our, in our diversity courses, um, our instructors are now starting to talk to white friends. Yeah. And to call that, that is the proper language for the legacy of, of what's happened in this country. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you... That's an element of it. So I think that white supremacist ideology is the valuation piece of it. But I think, so I define racism as a system of structuring opportunity, 
and assigning value. So white supremacy undergirds that valuation piece of it, but the opportunity structure isn't addressed by that ideology. That ideology then results in the, in the structuring of opportunity. But I think we have to address the structuring of opportunity well, because nobody has to feel like they're better than anybody else for our for the, for the legacy of poor neighborhoods with poorly funded schools and therefore poor educational opportunities in another generation lost to continue without active intervention, without anybody thinking they're better than anybody, right? It's already, the structures have already been put in place. And as I was about to say, when I close up on institutionalized racism, I say that it can be through acts of doing, acts of commission, as well as acts of not doing, acts of omission, and very often in institutionalized racism shows up as inaction in the face of need, right? So that even though the funding of public schools based on local property taxes was not something that was a race-based strategy, blah, blah, blah. When we see that it differentially has adverse impacts on communities of color who are in poor neighborhoods with poorly funded schools and we do not act, that inaction in the face of need is a reflection of racism. So, so I just need to say that too. So white supremacist ideology, clearly, you know, that's the value piece. This opportunity structure is, is another piece. Other questions or comments? I am loving that you guys are talking, right? And that you have these very sophisticated questions, I have to say. It's very good. So I'm going to move on to the second level of racism that I describe, personally mediated racism, which I define as the differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others by race, and then differential actions based on those assumptions. So this is what most people think of when they hear the word racism. Somebody did something to somebody. You know, it includes the different idea, the prejudice, and then the different action, the discrimination. Many people would call this interpersonal racism. I call it personally mediated racism, although my mouth twists up every time I say that, <laughs> because I am still understanding racism as a system, and this is the system mediated through people. Examples of how it can impact your health include police brutality. I used to, I used to talk about, imagine you were pulled over, for driving while black or driving while Latino and then interpreted as resisting arrest and hit upside the head or worse. Now I just can give you a litany of names. I can give you Eric Garner and Mike Brown and Freddie Gray and Walter Scott and Tamir Rice. And, and I can give you Trayvon Martin, wasn't even a police officer, some self-appointed neighborhood watchman who saw that young boy and said, that boy did not belong here. And Trayvon wasn't even allowed to stand his own ground. Talk about stand your ground when you're being pursued by some grown man, you know. So on and on and on. So we have many examples now that are well known to all of us. These things didn't just start happening. These things have been happening for, for centuries and decades. There have been communities that have been known about this, and there have been people trying to make complaints to police, you know, and, and the unions, there's a, the what, a blue wall of silence. And, you know, there's a whole thing about that, right? But now because we have dash cams, we have cell phone videos and all, we are knowing more about these things. There's still not the accountability that we need. But so police brutality can clearly impact not only the health of people who have been directly impacted, but the health of family members who worry about their sons and daughters, their husbands and wives every day. Physician disrespect, which can be as subtle as a physician not giving a patient the full range of treatment options because the physician figures, well, that patient couldn't afford or wouldn't comply or wouldn't understand, right? Or whatever it is that they assume. But that physician disrespect can also be quite blatant, like sterilization abuse, which has many iterations in our nation's history. I see my OBGYN colleague shaking her head. Absolutely. Shopkeeper vigilance, being followed around in stores, not even being asked, may I help you, but just being under surveillance, right? Or waiter indifference, not getting quick, respectful treatment. These are just two manifestations of what some people call everyday racism, kind of the microaggressions, the subtle communication of disrespect that happens. And then teacher devaluation, a very important manifestation of personally mediated racism. Because if a teacher looks at a young child and thinks, that child can't learn, and puts them off in the ADD trap, that child will never even know their full potential, much less have the opportunity to develop to their full potential. Now, personally mediated racism, like institutionalized, can be through acts of doing, acts of commission, as well as acts of not doing, acts of omission. But even more important is that personally mediated racism can be unintentional, as well as intentional. That is, you do not have to have intended to do something racist to have had a racist impact. The third level of racism that I describe, internalized racism, 
I'm speaking right now from the point of view of members of the stigmatized races, and I define it as acceptance by members of the stigmatized races of negative messages about our own abilities and intrinsic worth. Now, people who do anti-racism training would say, well, what about the internalized sense of entitlement that many white people are walking around with? Isn't that also internalized racism? And I have to agree. And I think maybe I haven't given enough attention to that. I sort of package that off as a background norm type of thing with my institutionalized. So right now, though, I am talking from the point of view of members of the stigmatized races. How can this impact our health? Self-devaluation, feeling maybe I'm really not as good as. Maybe I shouldn't try to graduate from high school or apply to that college or try to become a doctor or try to live in that neighborhood. And that self-devaluation also turns into fratricide, so black on black or Latino on Latino crime, because if you don't value yourself, you won't value others that look like you and you just as soon off them as not. The white man's ice is colder syndrome. That phraseology comes from my parents' generation and what it meant in those days and what it still means today for many. Say you're a black person and you need a lawyer, you might seek out a white lawyer mm -hmm, over a black lawyer. Or you might go look for a white doctor over a black doctor. In fact, if your water was warm, you might go way down the street to get the white man's ice over the black man's ice, deeply believing that the white man's ice is colder, deeply internalizing the myth of white superiority. Resignation, helplessness, hopelessness turns into a lot of, of self-destructive health behaviors, turns into not registering to vote, turns into not voting even if you are registered. All of these things have health impacts. And really, internalized racism is about members of the stigmatized races accepting limitations to our own full humanity of the box into which we've been placed. So when we hear young high school students of color, one of them's trying to be the valedictorian and the friends are saying, oh, you know, so-and-so is just trying to be white, we need to challenge that. Because since when did white people claim exclusive access to excellence? They did not. So now I'm going to illustrate these three levels of racism with one of my allegories. I have about 20 some odd allegories now. Each of them, or most of them, sparked by something I've seen with my own real eyes. So first I'm going to share with you an experience that I had from my own life that I saw with my own real eyes, and then I'm going to make it a story about racism. So my husband and I, newly married, moving back down to Baltimore so I can finish my PhD at Hopkins, bought our first freestanding house with a big wraparound porch with flower boxes dotted all around on the porch. And we bought this house in October, so that wasn't the time to plant. But when spring came, we're all excited. We're going to decorate our cute little house. And so we run out there with our marigold seeds. And then we said, oh, some of these boxes have dirt in them, but some of the boxes were empty. So my husband goes down to the gardening store, and he hauls big old bags of potting soil back, and we fill up the empty boxes. And then we take equal numbers of our marigold seeds and put them in all of the boxes. And we water them all. And honestly, because I'm not the gardener in the family, I had about reached my limit in terms of helping with this enterprise. But <laughs> so I sit back, sit back to be delighted, right? Three weeks later, as I walk out, onto, out of my front door onto my porch, I literally stopped in my tracks because as I looked at my flower boxes, it looked to me like we had planted completely different species in some of the boxes versus the others. Some of the boxes ha had lots of plants in them, and, and they were you know, strong and vigorous looking, and other boxes just had a few plants in them, and they were scrawny and scraggly looking. And then I realized what had happened. What had happened was that that potting soil was rich, fertile soil so that every single seed planted in the potting soil had at least sprouted. And the strong seed had grown very tall and vigorous, but even the weak seed had made it halfway up. While that old soil that we had found in the boxes, that turned out to be poor rocky soil. So the weak seed planted in the poor rocky soil had just died, and even the strong seed in the poor rocky soil had to struggle to make it to a middling height. Now you guys, some of you nodding your heads, so maybe you're gardeners, and maybe you've composted half of your garden, and maybe you've seen this image with your own real eyes, and the image is about the importance of the soil the importance of the environment, right? But now I'm going to take this image and I'm going to make this a story about racism by introducing a gardener. So now we have a gardener who has two flower boxes, one which she knows to have rich, fertile soil and one which she knows to have poor, rocky soil. And she has seed for the same kind of flowers, except some of the seed is going to produce pink blossoms and some of the seed is going to produce red blossoms. And this gardener prefers red over pink. So what does she do? She takes a red seed and she puts it in the rich fertile soil and the pink seed she puts over in the poor rocky soil. And three weeks later in her flower boxes, she sees what I saw in mine. In that rich fertile soil, all of the red seed has sprouted. The strong red seed has grown very tall and vigorous. The weak red seed makes it at least halfway up. 
In that poor rocky soil, the weak pink seed has died. Here comes a strong pink seed just struggling to make it to a middling height. And then in these two boxes, those flowers go to seed. And then the next year, the same thing happens. And then those flowers go to seed. And year after year after year after year after year, the same thing happens until finally about 10 years later, the gardener is looking at her flower boxes and she says, you know, I was right to prefer red over pink. So we're going to interrupt the story there to say this first part of the story is how institutionalized racism works. Where you had the initial historical insult of the separation of the seed into the two types of soil, you had the contemporary structural factors of the flower boxes keeping the soil separate, and then through inaction in the face of need, perpetuation of this inequity. But now we're going to pick the story back up and say, okay, well, where is personally mediated racism in the garden? Well, the gardener's looking over at red and thinking red is beautiful. And then she looks over at pink and she says, oh, those pink flowers sure are scrawny and scraggly. So she plucks off the pink blossoms before they can even go to seed. Or maybe she notices that a pink seed has blown into the rich fertile soil. So she plucks it out before it can establish itself, which is some of the anti-affirmative action stuff that goes on. And where would internalized racism be in the garden? Well, the red flowers are just living their lives, enjoying being red, many of them not even appreciating or understanding or acknowledging that they're benefiting from enriched soil. The pink flowers are looking over at red thinking, mm, red is mighty fine and wishing with all their hearts that they too could be red. And then here come the bees and the bees are minding their own business, right? Collecting nectar and pollinating. But here comes a bee and it goes into one of these pink flowers and then to another pink flower, then to this pink flower and this flower's like, get away from me bee, don't bring me any of that pink pollen, I prefer the red because the pink flower has internalized that red is better than pink. So now the question arises, what do we do to set things right in this garden? So we can start by addressing the internalized racism and we can go over to the pink flowers and we can say, pink is beautiful, power to the pink. And that is an important intervention. But if that's all we do, it's not gonna change the conditions in which the pink flowers find themselves. So you say, okay, well let's deal with the personally mediated racism. So let's go have a conversation with the gardener. Or better yet, let's have a workplace multicultural workshop for the gardener. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. I endorse. Highly endorse. Right? OK. So, so we have <laughs> these folks are cracking up over here. So we have our workshop. And in the workshop, we say, dear gardener, would you please stop plucking those pink flowers? And maybe she will, and maybe she won't. But even if she stops plucking the pink flowers, it's still not going to change the condition in which they find themselves. I think that if you really want to set things right in the garden, you need to address the institutionalized racism, which means you have to either break down the boxes and mix up the soil, or if you want to keep separate boxes, that's all right too, although in my mind, it makes it easier for the gardener to continue to segregate resources going forward. But if you keep separate boxes, it means you need to enrich that poor rocky soil until it's as rich as the rich fertile soil. And when you do that, the pink flowers will flourish. They'll be looking beautiful, grand, and glorious. And then through that intervention on the institutionalized racism, you will now also have addressed the internalized racism. Because now that the pink and red flowers are equally beautiful, pink will no longer be thinking red is better or wanting to be red. And in that intervention on the institutionalized racism, you may also address the, uh, oh, did I say personally mediated? I meant internalized. I don't know what word came out of my mind, but you'll have addressed the internalized. And you may also address the personally mediated. Okay, now the original gardener, she may have to go to her grave preferring red over pink. But her children who grow up and see the flowers equally beautiful be less likely to have that kind of attitude. So the, the story has been to illustrate these three levels of racism and to very strongly suggest that if we want to set things right in the garden, we need to at least address the institutionalized racism. Good to address all the levels at the same time, but at least address the institutionalized racism. And when we do, the other levels may take care of themselves. But there's one more question that I haven't even addressed yet. Before we leave this story, we need to ask, yes, okay. Yes. Ah, ooh, did you hear the question? What about the red flowers? What about them feeling like I'm not better than anybody anymore? Right. So, then, so you know what, though? But the red flowers would be like, this is such a beautiful garden. And we're getting all of these prizes for being a beautiful garden. Right? And oh, and I met a pink flower. We have beautiful little fuchsia children. Right? 
It's going to be a hard thing, but it's not as hard for the gardener, I mean, for the flowers to make that adjustment. The hardest thing is for the gardener to make that adjustment. And so even though I haven't gotten into who is the gardener, I will say this, that to the extent that the gardener could believe, after all of these centuries of believing that red, of preferring red over pink, because I used, my gardener's tale used to be about all about the differences in the quality of the soil. And then I've lifted up this values piece, this white supremacist piece, you know, the, the gardener's initial preference for red over pink as something that we also have to address. What is it going to take for the gardener to really, truly believe that? I think we're going to have to just do an intervention. We're going to have to enrich the soil out of faith or out of collective action, out of something, and make the gardener try that experiment. And then in one generation, we'll have the evidence. Otherwise, I, it's a hard nut to crack. But let me get to, um, to this, who is the gardener? Because the gardener, after all, is the one that I gave the power to decide, the power to act, and control of resources, which in my mind are actually the elements of self-determination, right? This slide used to say, who is the gardener? Government, power to decide, power to act, control of resources, until I went to work for government at the CDC. So then I modified my slide, <laughs> but it doesn't make government. And I recognize that there are people who are having to leave because they have a board meeting. So thank you so much for coming. I'm not worried about you guys leaving. Thank you so much. Um, so I modified my slide, but government is not the only part of the gardener, because, so, you know, media or foundations or corporations or even communities to the extent that they have self-determination can be part of the gardener. But whoever the gardener is, it's dangerous when the gardener is allied with one group. You know, I painted her red, that's why she prefers red over pink. And it's also dangerous when she's not concerned with equity, we can, when she can look at her flower boxes and think, my garden is beautiful because she hasn't even included the pink flowers as part of her garden. So our challenge is what to do about the gardener. Do we make the gardener striped? or polka dotted, or fuchsia, do the pink flowers have to grow or recruit their own gardener? So a lot of interesting questions that can come out. And before I open it for questions, I just want to share two that have come up before. Uh, the first one was uh, really almost a startler. It was like, Dr. Jones, excuse me, uh, why should the red flowers share their soil? I thought, that's a very important question. It's an important question because, first of all, it shows the power of this story to start conversations about racism. Because if I were talking about racism between you and me, that question would never even come up, right? My answer to why should the red flowers share their soil is that that soil doesn't belong to the red flowers. It belongs to the garden, right? But what if, here's the second question, what if that's not the original gardener? What if that's the gardener's great, great, great grandchild? Here we are. And that great, great, great grandchild has always seen the flower boxes looking like that. They don't even think there's a problem anymore. What do we do then? So there are three aspects to that answer. The first is that we have to make the differences in the height and vigor of the pink and red flowers a problem. Now, Dr. David Satcher, our 16th Surgeon General, and President Clinton did that when they announced an initiative to eliminate racial ethnic health disparities by the year 2010. They were saying, we are no longer going to try to take black infant mortality and white infant mortality and do this. No, decrease them all, but not worry about We are going to try to eliminate that gap, OK? But we didn't make it. Uh, it's 2016. And we haven't eliminated those racial and ethnic health disparities, even though we put lots of mind power and effort and money into it. And that's really probably because we are trying to prune this weed as opposed to get to the root. But that points out the importance of the second thing. We weren't successful because we really perhaps weren't attending to the differences in the quality of the soil. So we need to make those flower boxes transparent. We need to talk about the differences in the quality of the soil. But then the third thing is maybe even more important, because if they're transparent, then we have to make it very clear that that pink soil didn't just jump over into that poor rocky soil. We have to talk about history at every decision-making table. And all of us, we are an ahistorical society. We need to teach our own full histories. Right? And we need to talk about the gardener's agency in all of this. And this is where, you know, my gardener's tale used to be about differences in the quality of the soil. And then I recognized that if we equalize things today, but that gardener continued to prefer red over pink, she would find ways to continue to favor, privilege red over pink. And we have to do the values piece, the work that we were talking about earlier. 
So I'm about to leave the gardener's tale. Any questions or comments? Yes. Okay, here first and then here. Um, I just want to make a comment about kind of what Dr. Jando was saying um, with the red flowers and whatnot. I guess like one way that I've sort of been able to conceptualize racism and what it does to people of color and also to white people is just like the ability that racism has to like sap every person of their humanity a bit, which you mentioned with humanity, but I also think like when I think about what racism does to me as a white person, like I really think it takes part of my humanity away in the ways that I participate in racism benefited from racism and feel less human. Um, and so I think that like if racism were to be eliminated and if all the flowers were the same, you know, the same vigor and whatnot, that I think that the red flowers and the white people would really be able to feel more fully human as a result of like the other folks, the other flowers also reaching their full human or flower potential. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right too. I actually, you know, so I used to teach at the Harvard School of Public Health and my classes were usually at least half white because I mean, that's who's at the Harvard School of Public Health, right? Um, and so I would, you know, we would do, look at measures of racism. We did all kinds of stuff in the semester, but I would also do some of the storytelling. And at the end, I would challenge my students to write a short allegory to explain some aspect of race or racism to their grandmother or to a neighbor. And many of the white students' stories were about that very thing, about the loss that they have in terms of friendships, in terms of humanity, in terms of being fearful or you know, whatever, because of racism still being there. And, and I never like hammered that in, but that was, that was the feeling of many people, that there is a loss, even as they're feeling better than in their minds, but, but that, that maybe that better than taking is taking a, a, taking a part of their mind that was their human part. You know, that maybe the, it's the same space and you can't have it in both, and so they're losing the humanity in that. Yes? Uh, yeah, with the flower boxes, I love this analogy, and I imagine they become transparent. We can see, we can start trying to equalize them, but in my understanding of changing the system, at least when I think about the public school system, you can't keep them separate. They will never be equal. Ever. And so... I'm not advocating for keeping them separate, but I also don't want to tell people that they can't because we could if we were vigilant. We would have to be vigilant. Theoretically, we would have to be very vigilant if we wanted to, but what would be the point at that point? Right now, the point of the separation is all about distribution of resources and risks, right? So at the point where we weren't so invested, so this gets to some of your, some of your question, at the point when we weren't so invested in making sure that the red had better, there would be no point. It's almost too much labor to have separate boxes, you know? So, so the need, once we, so maybe I have it all wrong. So, you know, my gardener's tale was all about the differences in the quality of soil, and now I'm adding the values piece, and maybe what you said is right. And maybe we have to address the, the white supremacist ideology, the cultural racism, the gardener's initial preference for red over pink first. I don't know. I think we have to do it all at the same time. I, I don't, because I'll tell you what I honestly think. There are people who are still alive, who are alive in, in, in 1963, who own gas stations who in 1963 would not let us, you know, if we were driving from Detroit to, to Tennessee, as we often did in the summer, you know, wouldn't sell us gas, right? Now they have to sell us gas. They're still alive and they still don't want to sell us gas, but they have to sell us gas. There are people, you know, there are laws, when you change laws and opportunity structures, I don't care what the people think. Because what happens is after those people die out unless they're very uh, determined to pass on their attitudes to their children. The reality of things will often, you know, maybe over two generations wash out some of those attitudes. But, but this, so I don't know. So we have to deal with the values piece. We have to deal with the opportunity structure piece. I don't even know how I got off in this rant. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, okay, I'll be quiet. Yes. So, you know, what we're having these days is, you know, a bug infestation of the garden, the global threat to the garden, someone's lighting the, the house on fire, or so the people see. And so, you know, this is changing also how the gardener thinks and acts uh, more than if the garden was doing well, right? Mm -hmm. if, if there's, you know, lots of sunshine and rain when you need it and everything, the 
then, you know, the gardener doesn't really care as much. Mm. So, you know, how, how, do, how does the gardener change things, or how do we change the garden when, you know, there's an infestation of ladybugs? Or right. So, but you know what? The gardener might be surprised that the pink flowers are more resistant to that infestation. So the gardener has been preferring red over pink and is trying to you know, protect the red, but then all of a sudden they're going to have no garden except that the pink flowers are surviving. The pink flowers actually, actually have been selected for survival and strength all the time, but under this new assault there might be some advantage that the gardener never imagined and may still refuse to see or acknowledge. But, but, that, but maybe, there, maybe it's something like that that has to even interrupt the gardener's strong, learned preference for red over pink. So, uh, to pick up on what Maggie you said, I think this is one of the things that's making this very hard to have this conversation, is because I do think that, that white people are losing their humanity, and to talk about racism and confront racism makes them feel um, bad, stereotype, threat type thing. But, at the same time, that's hard on the other side to see, I think, to see white people then focusing on how racism is impacting them is not just a manifestation of white privilege, to sort of um, turn the tables back again. Uh -huh. And until, until that part of the conversation can happen, like, okay, you've lost some of your humanity, but that doesn't mean this is an equal loss. Right. And we still have to move forward together. Right. It, it, Right, because I'm not only losing part of my humanity, I'm losing my life, or, you know, <laughs> you know, or my, my kids will never learn, or, you know, I mean, they've been neurologically damaged, for, you know, I mean, all of this stuff. So, so um, we all have a part in it. I don't think she was saying, of course not. no, so, okay. <laughs> just, just, yeah, just give me a little pass, I didn't think so. Right, but I understand what you're saying, that, that, that people saying, so I think it's important for white people to recognize the many impacts that racism has on them. At the health department this morning, we had a conversation, and you know, it was like, you know, Vermont is the second whitest state in the nation, so you know, sometimes people feel like this is an irrelevant conversation and all, and I said, aren't there white people here? <laughs> you know, but, but white people are thinking, I'm just human, I'm not part of this racialized conversation unless there's somebody else here, because white people don't even recognize their whiteness, they just, all of us are fully human, but white people sort of can have the luxury to live that full humanity and not in a racialized way in this country. So, so um, I don't know where I was going with that either, but do you know where I was going with that? Well, I think the, I think the idea of white guilt yes. can stop the conversation. So, so the, white, the white guilt, so let me put it this way. I don't go... I am so careful to describe racism as a system that I'm not in the business of saying who's racist and who's not. Because all of us are racist. And I'm going to tell you why we're all racist. I'm racist too. Most of my racism is against me and people like me, but you know, we're, we're all racist. It's almost as if you imagine that racism is a cement factory spewing cement dust. And if you are near that cement factory for two years, two months, two weeks, you're going to have cement dust in your lungs. And the only way not to have cement dust in your lungs, and you're going to stay here, is to put on a gas mask, that is to become actively anti-racist. And the job is not just for you to put that on to protect yourself, but you're going to put that on, try to have other, and then you're going to try to shut down the cement factory. Right? So, but I'm not in the job of saying, okay, you're okay and you're not, right? We are all racist. We all have things that, and as long as we, if we grew up here, I don't know how we're going to shut it, right? But even people who come here will develop those attitudes and they'll see the same images and all and, and those children will grow up and have the same limiting ideas about their possibility. So racism is a system and it's affecting all of us. So don't come and saying, oh, well, please stamp me okay. I'm not in that business. I'm talking about the system. I'm not even judging who's racist. And I, I am assuming we are all racist. That is not even a question in my mind. Yes? themes here, that um, as a white person, as a male person, I get to be in that, and the air I breathe is privilege, etc. And 
I may not even be aware of what I'm losing, whether it's humanity, but I may be a little more conscious of what I might be losing if I lie. So I'm going to be protecting my privilege, whether I'm conscious of it or not. Right. And so every moment of the day, I'm going to make individual choices about whether I'm an ally or not an ally. And, and not even consciously, that. not even consciously, not even consciously. So this is the whole thing of, you know, why should the red flowers share their soil is, is, is the question again. Like, what am I going to lose if I even acknowledge racism? And it gets back to this, this question, because people don't know what they are losing now. That's why the conversation about how it saps the strength of the whole society is a very important conversation. Because if I recognize that because of my white skin privilege, I do have advantages, and I'm not recognizing how, even with those individual advantages, the society that I'm enjoying, the society I'm leaving to my children is sapped of its full vitality and possibility. If I'm not aware of that loss, then I will think I only have my interest to protect. So that's why I think it's important for us to talk about how racism saps the strength of the whole society. I recognize it's a, you know, I, people would say, oh, well, just hold us harmless. You know, let's, let's fill the other, so, you know, flower pot, but, um, but don't take any of my soil. That may not be possible unless we go to the defense garden over there and take all the fertilizer. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, so, okay. I'm trying to do something, and I, I want to look at you, but I want to also get this, because I see people are having to leave, and there's one more story. If you don't have to leave uh, for the next five minutes, then stay, because this is a, an amazing story, too. And somebody who knows how to do this, help me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it started again. No, 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 okay, so, so get me to the dual reality. Okay, so now I'm back with you. So um, I think the, the message that we're hearing so much with the campaign season is of generating fear particularly white male men who don't have much else to lose except their white maleness. And, um, uh, and I think that ends up being a little scary. I'm hopeful of what you were saying earlier of a generational shift will happen, but I was afraid of how many brown skin people will have to die, um, or will die in that what I wish was a final battle, but not a battle. I wish was more recognition, and um, it's, it's precarious. I think that if white people in this room take it as your um, urgent job to prevent that battle, but to do the work with other white people, that we'll be better off. So, Because I can tell stories all day long. I can convince you, but, but I can't go to everybody. You all will hear conversations. You'll be in places that I'll never be. You'll hear things that I'll never hear. And you will be more believable to the people who need to be than I ever would. So I am charging all of the white people in this room, especially to take the struggle to, to white people. All of us are trying to take the struggle to the, to the nation, but, but that's your particular job. Yes. So, um, and so I strongly agree with that statement. You know, the red flowers need to fix the system. But I am a struggling pink flower helping other pink flowers. And so what advice would you have for those of us who are mentoring pink flowers at all levels, from kids through junior faculty, um, in, in this whole system? What is your advice? My advice is that we need to um, support one another, especially when we're, in, when we're in positions of power. So often, we get in positions of power, and we're so much trying to get to the next level that we don't see the power that we have to hire somebody or to admit a student or to mentor somebody, so we need to do that. I think that for our kids, we need to have frank conversations. We don't want to stifle their humanity. We don't want them to walk around uh, afraid. We don't want them to shuck, shuck and jive, but we want them to be alive. You know, so Jordan Davis, the young man who, who was in the backseat of a car where they were playing their music loud, and they thought they could play their music loud like other teenagers could play their music, music loud, and then he was shot, and the man who shot him just went on and, and you know, uh, with his girlfriend and then turned turn himself in the next day. You know what I'm saying? So I don't want my child to constrain their humanity, but we have to let them know when the police officers approach you, put your hands on the steering wheel, and yes, sir, and no, sir, and that still doesn't help. You know, it doesn't protect us. Um, we have to let our kids know that 
they are fully human and fully available, I mean, able to do everything, and yet they live in this society. So we have to do the, the wake-up notice about where we are. We have to do the positive images, the black art, the black books, and the black everything. We have to teach our histories. All of us should be studying our full histories as a nation. But in particular, those whose histories have been sh hidden from them need to learn our histories. So we may have to have Saturday schools or whatever, but we need to teach our histories. Um, and we need to be in solidarity with one another. And I actually, I love Kwanzaa, which is a, a holiday that was created in the United States based on African harvest festivals. But there are seven principles of Kwanzaa. So Kwanzaa is the seven days from December 6th, 26th through January 1st. And the seven principles, the Nguzo Saba, are Umoja, unity. Kuji Chagulia, self-determination. Ujima, collective work and responsibility. Ujima, cooperative economics. Nia, purpose. Kuumba, creativity. And Imani, faith. And if we, as an African American or people of color, all of us would take these principles of community building and actually implement them, I think that that's important. So we have to do the, we have to do the stuff in the pink box that we have to. We have to try to run for office. Not just vote, but run for office. We need to, we need to um, be unafraid to say racism. Our kids, the kids of advantaged black families who've been going to all of these schools and now in all of these fancy colleges and all of this, who know that they are smart, need to understand that there have been brilliant black folks in this country for centuries and the reason they have those opportunities is because they're standing on the shoulders of others, which means they have to stand tall so others can stand on their shoulders. But they have to get that sense of, of like, the problem's not solved. You know, they're walking around thinking maybe racism doesn't exist anymore. But if you talk to the young brothers and sisters who are stuck in, in ghettoized situations without opportunity, they very much know that racism is alive and well. But there's some of us, children of those maybe on the faculty here or whatever, my children, who might not see it so much. You know, they have friends from all over and stuff like that. So we need to, uh, all of us acknowledge that racism is alive and well and that it's a problem that we all need to address. So that's just some ideas off the top. Yes? I'm a little confused because from what's been said, and, and as a white male, I've lost something. I didn't know this before, but now I know I've lost, or believe I've lost something. I've lost part of my humanity. So how do I determine what I've lost and what does it mean to be fully human so I can, and other people? Because we're using that term. Right. And I don't know what it means. So I think it's to, um, I, I would like to have white people answer that because, I mean, I don't feel that loss. Okay, so I'm not telling you, oh, you lost something, you're less than fully human, but I, I understand what's being said. I think what it is is that by not acknowledging the full humanity of everybody around you, you diminish yourself. It's, you know, Dr. King, you know, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere um, type, of, type of thinking. And so what you've lost is, the, is that recognition. Uh, I mean, I just wanted to speak to that, like, for what, what I was saying, I guess, like, when I don't have a choice to participate in this system, because this is the system that we all live in and that I live in, and, and I wish that I had a choice to not you know, a million, a million little things, to get a cab first before a person of color would or something, or to walk by somebody on the street who needs help and I'm just gonna keep walking by or whatever. There's like a million ways in which I participate. I go to, I got into, you know, school and like get to do all sorts of things because I'm white and those are opportunities that I like and am now like able to um, admit that like I enjoy that privilege. Um, but that is also like a, a painful thing to know that like everything that I have is something that somebody else, when things aren't equal in a society, the people that have more have more because other people don't. Right. It's the reciprocal, I mean, I reciprocal like unfair advantage. I want to say three things. So, so, the, so one is about a swimming party. Oh, I, you know, they go so fast. Oh, I already lost one of them. Okay. Huh? So I just do with the, with the, okay, so, so do you guys remember in Houston, I think it was, in Texas, so there were some young kids who were having a birthday, black kids at the swim thing, and then uh, the police came and slammed and sat on this young woman and all like that, okay. How do we know that that happened? 
because one of their friends was a white young man, and he videotaped it on his phone. And he said in an interview, it was almost as if I were invisible to the police. So, but he recognized his white privilege and he used it so that, every, so that we could know that that thing even went down. So you will never be able to shed your white skin privilege in this society these days, but you can acknowledge it and use it. And that's what that young man did out of his friendship for his friends. There were two other things that I was going to say, and I already lost them. I, I, I was looking for a pen, and I didn't have a pen here. But I want to share this. Oh, yes. No, okay. I was just going to share that there are also great books out there that can answer that question about loss, by White Like Me, by Think Wise, or there are so many resources now yes. that I think it has to do with when, when you are a white person, you have a responsibility for self-reflection and hunger for knowledge. Right. which I think that's one of the issues I, I, I don't see you know, in many white people, is trying to find out what's, hap what's happening around that. Why are we benefiting from right. these things? But, and if we don't find the answers, there are so many books right now. Or even going to Peggy McIntosh, reading those 40 things that she wrote, right. that opens people's minds about white privilege. Do you know these resources? So Peggy McIntosh, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, it's just a, it's a little like treatise. And then Tim Wise, who's written White Like Me and many other books. He's an anti, white anti-racist activist in Memphis, I think, in Memphis. So if you just Googled some of that work, um, that would be useful. Yes. I know you really want to get to your story, but I'm um, dying to bring this issue up because I feel like it's such a conversation ender. Um, or just around the American dream, because I feel like there, there are people who just don't believe what you're saying. And that is kind of a core value, the American dream, that anybody from any background can make it if they work hard. And so could you just respond yes, to that? Yes, I will. And so I identify actually four, I used to have three, but now four core societal values that, are, that we're going to have to deal with. Okay, one of them is that I call that the myth of meritocracy. So the, the, the meritocracy story goes something like this. If you work hard, you'll make it. And clearly, most people who have made it have worked hard. But there are you know, some people who've made it who never worked hard a day in their lives. But there are many, many other people who have worked just as hard, as hard or harder who will never make it because of an uneven playing field. And it's that, but how do we demonstrate that uneven playing field? So at some point, people are going to have to open their eyes. That's why we have to make the, the boxes transparent. We have to be talking about that uneven playing field. When people deny racism, they're, un, they're denying that uneven playing field. They say, well, these people obviously must be stupid or lazy because they haven't made it. So that's a very strong mythology in our, in our thing. We have to challenge that by showing the real differences in resources and risk, the real differences in opportunities. We can do that as epidemiologists or as a journalist or whatever. So that myth of meritocracy is one thing. A second is that we're very ahistorical in this society. So we believe that things have always been the way they were when we were born and always going to be that way. It makes structures permanent and systems kind of immutable. And we need to challenge that, right? Then the third one is the inordinate focus on the individual. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And we don't even, the individual doesn't even sometimes include our cousins. You know, like we're very nuclear family, and it makes um, systems and, and structures irrelevant. Even if we could see them, they're irrelevant. And then the fourth is this, this kind of American exceptionalism thing, which makes us not look around to see who's doing things better. You know, the American exceptionalism makes our gardener not even want to walk down the street to see how other people's gardens are looking and what they did to get them that way, right? So, um, so I, those are hard things. How do we deal with it? I think we have to really shine the bright light of, you know, of inquiry and of, of differences. There are real differences in opportunities and life exposures and stresses and all of that. We have to be talking about those things. I do want to share this, and then um, I appreciate you staying. What time is it, actually? It's 7 OK, so I, I'm not too bad, right? Weren't we supposed yeah, to go to 7? Yeah, OK. Oh, whoa. OK. You won't get dinner. So this is actually one of my other allegories. I was going to share three other allegories. I was going to talk to you about how. I am going to say one thing before I share this. That definition I gave you of racism can be generalized to be a definition of any system of structured inequity. This is in answer to a question you raised earlier. So 
You could say, what is sexism? That's a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on gender that unfairly disadvantages some, unfairly advantages others, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And there are many of axes of inequity operating in our society, intersecting in communities and individuals. So, I mean, I could pull that slide up, but I don't know how to do it. So I just tell you, you know, so they include things like, you know, gender and, and uh, nationality, language, uh, immigration status, geography, lots and lots of axes of inequity operating. And so, as I said earlier, I recognize those. I'm not like, oh, racism is the only, only thing going on. I recognize, but because racism is foundational in our nation's history, and yet many people are in denial of its continued existence and profound impacts on the health and well-being, not just of people of color, but of the whole nation, I think that it's imperative for us to name racism, to ask how is racism operating here, and to organize and strategize to act. I think that that is our priority. And when, as we do so, then these other things will learn from how we're doing it or have ancillary benefits or whatever. So, so that's why I focus my work on race as the axis of inequity and racism as the system. I'm not trying to say whose oppression is worse than others. I'm not trying to play any of this. I'm not trying to splinter any kind of joint movement. But we must name racism. Um, so I'm going to tell this. This um, allegory, and this is how I'll close, was when I was um, a medical student at Stanford. And I, we were studying late in an apartment, and we got hungry, and there was no food in the apartment, so we decided that we're going to walk into town and find something to eat. So we go into town, and we find a restaurant, and we sit down, and you know, menus are given to us, and we place our order, and the food is served, and we're eating. Here we are. Not a remarkable story so far. Many of you people have had that experience of going into a restaurant and ordering food. But as I sat there eating, I glanced across the room, I looked up, and I noticed a sign, and the sign was a profound revelation to me about racism. So now you're wondering, like, really? In Palo Alto? <laughs> right. What did the sign say? Sign said, open. You're like, what? OK, so here, picture this. Here I am, sitting at the table of opportunity, eating, and I glance up, and I see a sign that says, open. If I hadn't known something about the two-sided nature of those signs, I would not have realized that, in fact, now the restaurant was closed due to the hour, and that hungry people just a few feet away from me, but on the other side of the sign, would not be able to come in, sit down, order their food, and eat. And then I understood how racism structures two-sided signs in our society. It structures a dual reality, where on the inside, the people sitting at the table of opportunity eating don't even recognize that there's a two-sided sign going on, because it's difficult to recognize a system of inequity that privileges us. It is difficult for men to recognize male privilege and sexism. It is difficult for white people in this country to recognize white privilege and racism. It's difficult for all Americans to recognize our American privilege in the global context, except we got a little hint of that with Ebola. Did we not, right? Yet, those on the outside recognize very well that there's a two-sided sign going on because it proclaims closed to them, and yet they can look through the window and see people inside eating. So for those on the inside who are saying, is there really a two-sided sign? Does racism really exist? I acknowledge it's hard to know when you only see open. In fact, that's part of your privilege, not to have to know. But once you do know, you can choose to act. So it's not a scary thing to name racism or to understand it. It's an empowering thing. It doesn't compel you act, to act, but you can choose to act. And if you care anything about those people on the other side of the sign, then maybe you can talk to the restaurant owner who's actually there inside with you, and you can say, why don't you open up your restaurant? You, you know, there are hungry people outside. You'll make more money, and oh, the conversations we can have, right? Or maybe you'll pass food through the door, or help break down the glass, or tear down the sign, or whatever it is, but you won't be sitting there saying, hmm, I wonder why those people don't just walk in and sit down and eat, because you'll understand something about the two-sided nature of the sign. If you have two more minutes, I can close with my conveyor belt analogy. You have two more minutes for that one? OK. So for this one, I'm actually going to move. So, so this it doesn't come from something from my own real life. This image actually is borrowed from the book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race by Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum, who just retired as being president of Spelman College. In her book, she has an image. I'll describe the image. And then I 
elaborate on her image to talk about how we become actively anti-racist. So in her book, she describes racism basically as a conveyor belt. And most people just on the conveyor belt living their lives, they're not trying to go toward racism or through racism, but inexorably they are surrounded by racism and going toward racism. And if they just looked up, you know, there's a big sign that says racism, racism, right, right? But most people are just living their lives, going to work, going to school, whatever. There might be some who look up and see racism and then they close their eyes because they're in denial, but they keep just doing their work and all on this conveyor belt. Some people might look up and see racism and they turn around, they, they don't want to see it. They don't, wanna, but they're still on the same conveyor belt. So maybe they're colorblind, right? Here we are on the conveyor belt. I'm going to put us on the conveyor belt. And I'm going to expand on, on this to say, here we are on the conveyor belt, and now we look up and we see racism, and we don't want to go there. So what do we do? We have to turn around at least and start walking at least as fast as the conveyor belt is moving just to stay in the same place, not to get deeper into it, right? And what happens if you start walking backwards on a crowded conveyor belt? You start bumping into people, and they're like, hey, Watch it, buddy, where are you going? And this is your stage. Well, I didn't say this, that racism is most often passes, but this is your chance to do the first of three stages of being actively anti-racist. That stage is to name racism, to say, do you see where we're going? Do you want to go there, or will you turn around with me? And most people will say, hey, just get out of my way. Don't bother me, because they don't want to be disturbed out of their complacence. But maybe one or two will turn with you. So now you have two or three of you walking backwards, and you keep bumping into people and naming racism. And more, you keep inviting more, more people to turn with you, and never 50% will turn. Don't worry about it. But as you get more and more turning with you, now you've built up enough momentum not just to stay in the same place, but now you can make a little headway away from racism, but not really just away from racism. You are trying to get to the motor that is making this system work. So now here you are, and oh my God, it's there. There's the motor. I see it. So now this is your chance to do the second of the three stages of being actively anti-racist, which is to ask the question, how is racism operating here? Looking at the mechanisms of decision-making, looking at structures, the who, what, when, and where of decision-making, policies, the written how, practices, the unwritten how, and, and norms, the unwritten how, and values, the why. And you have to say, how is racism operating here? And lo and behold, I think it's this lever. So I pull up on the lever, and the system starts stuttering, and I did it. I did it. I got part of racism. But you know, it's a very fancy system. So it reconfigures itself, and it keeps on going, which points out the very important thing that we were discussing earlier up here. The third stage of being actively anti-racist is actually to organize and strategize to act. So as I'm pulling up on this lever, I need you to push that button. And I need you to pull on the levy, and I need you to swing that lever, whatever it is. And all of us working together can dismantle this system and put in its place a system in which all of us can know and develop to our full potential. And that is our challenge. I honestly believe, some of these I didn't show you, there was an allegory that I had about Japanese lanterns that was race as a social construct. I shared with you dual reality about racism creating this open closed sign and life on a conveyor belt moving to action. I am here in Vermont talking about racism with you because all of us need to be all in on this. As APHA president, American Public Health Association president, I am launching a national campaign against racism, inviting national organizations and community groups and all to join with us in naming racism, ask how is racism operating here, and organizing and strategizing to act. And I hope you guys are on board too. Thank you very much.